Let me get my screen up so I can share. So I'll be super quick because um, you all are definitely not here for me <laughs> and here for essay. So um, once again, just super quickly, my name is Genevieve. I am a program, I am one of two program coordinators at the Academic Commons. Um, so I oversee the Ask Us Desk, um, all of the study skills workshops I come out of the Academic Commons, the Let's GRE Together program, which is just a study cohort for those hoping to take the GRE. And then lastly, the Statistical Consultant program, um, of which uh, essay works in. I'm also a grad student in the Trachtenberg School of Public Policy and Administration. And so I have used some of the programs that the statistical consultants work with, I just haven't done them successfully. So um, at the Academic Commons, we like to call ourselves like a one-stop shop for academic resources and support on campus. And so that includes a lot of things such as peer tutoring, um, which is always free for the GW community, super easy to schedule. Um, you're working with students who look and are, have probably struggled just like you have and are prepared to help you um, succeed in your courses. And then we also have workshops and consultations too that kind of operate in the same way. And so uh, the consultants cover a variety of subjects, including coding, analyzing data, ge geographic information systems, uh, library resources, social media data, study skills, and a whole bunch of other things. Um, and so these programming consultations are always on a one-on-one -on -one, um, type basis, but we also offer students the opportunity to meet um, in groups if they were working, say, like on a group project or uh, research together as a group. Um, and so all of our equipments are made online at the Academic Commons website. Um, I just wanted to kind of let you all know that we exist. If you have any friends, any peers, um, any faculty who are interested in one-on-one um, -on -one support, um, like what I say offers and our other consultants offer, uh, please feel free to shoot us an email or visit our website, give us a call. I can also drop my email address in the uh, chat box as well in case anyone wanted to connect one-on-one. -on -one. So again, thank you all uh, for the opportunity to be here today and I'll toss it over to SA. Hi, everyone. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Okay. Um, so uh, welcome to the presentation on um, an introduction to machine learning in Python. Um, so we're going to go through this presentation using this outline. Um, so we'll just go through a learning objective, and then we'll run through like uh, the basics of uh, machine learning and uh, walk through some of the applications, um, the types, and we're going to like uh, drill down on just one of the subtypes. And um, we'll move over briefly into deep learning, uh, talk about neural network, the perception, the convolution neural network. And we're gonna be talking a little bit about our case study and the coding section in KTH. Um, so before we do this, before I start, I really want to make a point because uh, I, from the introductions, I got a hang of the background of a couple of persons amongst us and um, like we are still new to, this is new to Python, some an R and all that, and maybe you might be looking at, oh, is this really right for me? Um, the good thing is the presentation or this the presentation it's meant for like I've tried as much as possible to make it really really um simple and so there's a lot of abstraction like not trying to do some making it really simple for you to digest so uh but then if there are other things that maybe you do not understand feel free to like ask me questions I would try to break them really easy um secondly it's really really impossible to learn everything about machine learning and justice we can do and uh, as much as this is this presentation is meant to be like it give you a broad insight to the world of machine learning and deep learning, and it's not exhaustive. So um, 
we were going to touch on a little bit of things and like focus on certain aspects, but this by no means exhaustive of what's machine learning and the possibilities in deep learning. And um, even at, with putting that into consideration, um, this one session still is still not enough. And so that's why we have um, a second session in um, two weeks time, I think because of the spring break next week. And so I think I just want to put that out so that we can understand. So for this session, I'm going to walk you through most of the theoretical aspects, the basics of deep, deep learning, of machine learning. And then in the second part, we're going to jump in into the coding section because that's one mistake most people make when they want to start programming, not just programming, sorry, machine learning. Um, machine learning is not, math, it's not primarily programming, it's more of like mathematics. And so if you do not understand like little of uh, the theoretical aspect, the mathematics, it's very easy for you to get frustrated if you attempt um, the programming and then it feels like a try and error. So the essence of the objective of this workshop, the learning objectives include understanding the basis of machine learning and deep learning, um, developing the mathematical intuition behind um, machine learning and deep learning, and um, understanding the basics of programming and machine learning and deep learning. Then, um, who is this for? Um, so you have little to no background in machine learning and deep learning. Um, you have basic understanding of linear algebra and calculus, probably high school or from freshman, um, and uh, when you're a freshman, and um, basic understanding of Python programming. Um, so it's not an expert level course or presentation. Okay, so with this, I think we can move ahead and start talking about like what's machine learning. I think this is something we'll be hearing everywhere, machine learning, artificial intelligence, what's it all about? Um, right before I do that also, so this is a data science Venn diagram. It's a very popular diagram in data science. And um, it's, it, it captures one of the major, um, it captures like the different interdisciplinary field that data science represents. Um, so you, for you to be a good data scientist, you have to like have, um, various skill sets, including programming and computer science, mathematics and statistics, and subject matter and knowledge, which is the field or the industry you're going to apply it in. So um, it's really, really important that these three areas. Now, having been deficient in any of these areas affects um, how well-rounded one is as a data scientist. And so if you're really good in mathematics and, and um, um, Programming tends to be like you just focus as a machine learning or an AI engineer. Um, for those that are really good in mathematics and subject, the subject matter expertise, you involve more in quantitative research. And these are areas that are valid. It's not like it doesn't make you less a person. It's just like the skill set you need to do your job. Um, but then I think the part that is really dangerous, <laughs> label the danger zone, it's the programming and the subject matter exercise only. Sometimes you feel like you, 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 you can't be a software engineer with just programming and the subject matter expertise, but you can't be a data scientist with that. You need the knowledge of mathematics and statistics to understand the basic intuition of how machine learning works or being a data scientist. And so that's why it's important that this presentation, we have to go through a little bit of mathematics and uh, to be able to understand what we're going to do in the project. Okay, so with that, um, so what's machine learning? Um, basically machine learning, it's the programming of computers so they can learn from input data. Um, that's as simple as I can put it. Uh, you do not want to program um, traditional form of programming software engineering, it's like you give the computer like input tax, you give it an instruction and it gives you, and it, and it, it, it prompts back, like it carries out the instruction and it gives you an output. So it performs the tax. However, machine learning, it's more or less like trying to program the computer so that it learns by itself. So you're sort of like not, it's like an implicit form of programming and to enable us to do this, there are several techniques 
that you can use and different algorithms that you can use to achieve this purpose. And those are the things we're gonna be looking at in the course of this presentation. And um, just out of the box, like learning, if you think about it outside the scope of machine learning technically, when you say learning, it's it's required, it refers to the process of like acquiring skills and knowledge through experience. And so we can map that now to the computer. The computer needs experience. The experience in this sense is data, right? And then the skills and the knowledge that it needs, it's uh, the computer needs can now be learned from the data, data, which is more or less like the patterns, could be the patterns in data and um, more like a function, a mapping. Those are some of the things, what we call a model. And so essentially it's still the same, we're trying to like create, that is, that is the form of intelligence we're trying to impute on the computer. The computer is now trying to learn the way we learn, right, as human beings. And that's like a more advanced aspect. There are more advanced techniques. That's what we're going to be talking about. Defending. So basically, like, it's, we need to understand that machine learning is a branch of artificial intelligence that enables computers to perform tasks without explicitly being programmed. And uh, what are some of the common applications of machine learning? It's all about around those. And it's no longer like far first, like we used to think that, oh, um, AI, I'm still waiting for AI to come take over the world. Um, machine learning is used in everyday application. And these are just a few, like in the medical field, it's used for cancer analysis or research. Um, hospital quality management, like maybe managing wait times, um, cost reduction, like optimization. Um, banking, using it to evaluate um, credits and also like predicting loan recovery rates in entertainment. Um, some of us use Netflix or Hulu and um, the, you can, you, there are a lot of recommendation. Um, ag there's recommendation algorithm that powers it and recommends movie based on, be, movies based on your choices and like your history. Even um, on Amazon, those are like recommendation engines. And uh, music recommendation, perhaps on Spotify or Apple Music, based on your listening history. Um, social media, you have chatbots. That's like another aspect of um, machine learning. Talking about natural language processing, chatbots, spam filters, your email filters, uh, fake news detection, like in social media, and also even recommendation on your news field. Those are like different um, ways uh, applications of machine learning. And also in mining oil and gas, like predictive maintenance of equipment, maybe you want to predict instead of waiting for an equipment to fail, you want to predict the remaining useful life of the equipment so you can maintain, carry out the maintenance, schedule maintenance before, you can schedule the maintenance before it fails. And these are like broad applications of machine learning. And so what are the types of machine learning, like the subtypes of machine learning we have? what we call the supervised learning, the unsupervised learning and reinforcement, reinforcement learning. Um, the re supervised learning, it's kind of task driven. And so it's dependent to your, if you have like an input and an output and you're giving it a specific task. So it's task driven. Um, I'm gonna elaborate on each of them uh, in a minute. Um, the unsupervised learning is data driven and reinforcement learning, it's learning from mistakes, more or less like playing games. And so um, when we talk about supervised learning, you have like the inputs and the outputs, and you're trying to like get a relationship or you're trying to get a relationship or get a function in this case, mathematically, you're trying to get a function that maps from the inputs to the outputs. In essence, you're trying to get a model that, that can represent the structure that maps it from the input to the output. And so you have under supervised learning, it can either be a classification problem or it could be a regression problem. So on the right, um, how you could see like the classification problem where you're trying to like classify maybe some data points like to this point, to the top part or the bottom part, like you want to classify it, or it could be a regression problem. Um, 
For unsupervised learning, you want to infer a function with presence, like inherence within a data set. So for unsupervised learning, you do not have the output, right? So unlike the supervised learning, you have the input and you have the output and you're just like finding a model that can connect it together or that represents that relationship. Um, for unsupervised learning, you do not have the, have the output and so you just have the data. So in such a situation, you are essentially finding the structure or like a function that represents the structure within that data. And so it's more or less like understanding the pattern within the data inherent in that data. And so an example, it's like clustering or like segmentation. You have the data, you want to like segment different aspects. And that is like a visual that represents unsupervised learning. Um, you have different uh, areas and you're just like clustering them together. And um, also cost other applications include um, customer segmentation. So you have things like maybe in the supermarket, you want to like get the high paying customers, you want to get the low paying customers. You probably can segment customers based on their cost and their spending habits also. So these are like different areas. And then you have reinforcement learning, which is becoming a very like, there's a lot of research going around reinforcement learning at this point. It's um, to map situations to actions. So essentially, you are performing an action. So you have like the best example I can give is of a baby trying to learn and probably performing an action. And then based on the action, the action, there is not like a reward. And based on that reward, is either going to like improve or like it's gonna make an the baby is gonna make an adjustment based on that reward. And so you have like probably the action could be learning to work. The baby currently maybe is lying down on the ground. That is the current state of the baby. And so the baby is learning to crawl or probably learning to work. Um, if that action is positive, like the baby learns how to work eventually, there is a reward for that. And maybe like that the reward it could be um the satisfaction that comes with with it, and then meaning is correct, and then the baby would continue doing that. So it's a form of like reward-based learning approach. Okay. So these are like the three broad types of machine learning. But we don't have time to go like in depth through all of them. But one of the most common aspects of supervised um, of machine learning, it's uh, the supervised learning. So we're going to drill down a bit into supervised learning. Um so as I mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, the supervised learning, it's um you are trying to learn a function that best approximates the relationship between the input and the output. And there are two broad classes of problems in um, supervised learning. You have the regression problems and then the classification problems. Now, the regression problems, the, you have, if you recall, I said the, in the supervised learning, you have the output just like you have the input. Um, but then the nature of the output determines the kind of problem you want to solve. And so if the output labels, it's a continuous variable, it falls under the category of regression problems. However, if the output labels are discrete, it falls under the classification problems. And so what I mean by continuous and discrete includes, uh, let's say for example, you want to um, predict housing price in DC. So if the, the price being the variable, it's kind of continuous because it's not, it's not a yes or no situation. It's like the price, it's a continuous variable. And so it would naturally fall under a regression problem. However, if I want to predict, um, say, um, cancer, if it's malignant or benign, it is either yes or no, right? And so that's a classification problem. The output label that it's discrete. So depending on the output label, depending on the, the, the nature of the output label, you can classify the problem into the regression and the classification problems. And then there are several algorithms that you use for like each of them. Under the regression problem, you have the 
the um, linear regression, you generalize linear regression, and then you use the neural networks also. Um, and then on the classification problems, you have uh, the logistic regression, the sub support vector machines, um, naive days, decision trees, k-nearest neighbors, and um, neural networks also. These are broadly like different algorithms, like common algorithms you can use for um, the different problems in supervised learning. And so to throw my light on this, I want to like take a problem. Um, let's talk about linear regression because it's pretty common amongst, uh, I think it's one of the first, especially if, if for those of us that have like maybe background in engineering or even generally statistical analysis, uh, linear regression, it's really common. And so um, in a sense, the reason I'm trying to like, I'm, and another reason I'm singling out linear regression, um, there's, there's a lot of similarities and tools we're going to be building from this that would relate to more complex um, areas like deep learning and neural networks um, that it's somehow similar to what we're going to be seeing in deep learning. So I would like us to like understand um, that when we talk about deep learning, it's not something like really um, try to create a relationship between what we know already and um, and what we're going to learn probably for the first time today. And so recap for those of us that probably do not understand or do not have never really talked about or seen anything about linear regression, um, a simple linear regression attempts to show a relationship, with, a relationship between two quantities. And so this is like an equation that represents a linear regression. Probably maybe in your research project, you've done statistical analysis and you have to like use a linear model. Um, so this is like a simple, this is a simple linear model, like an equation. You have like the constant term, which in this case is being beta naught. And then you have the, the independent variable and the dependent variable. The independent variable here is xt while its coefficient is beta one, right? And then it has a constant term, which is the intercept, which is B naught, a beta naught. And then yt is the dependent variable, right? And um, the error term, it's the, uh, it, you have the plus uh, et, which is the error term. And so this is pretty simple. It's like I said, it's a simple linear regression. We are just talking about just two quantities, but it's uh, in most practical scenario, you won't have maybe just two quantities. And so you would be dealing with more, two or more independent variables, which in which case we classify that as a multiple linear regression, where you attempt to model a relationship between the continuous dependent variable and two or more independent variables. Then this equation here models that relationship. So you have like the yt, which is the independent, which is the dependent variable in this case, and it's continuous because it's a regression problem. And you have this equation, you have beta one xi, which is the first feature of the first variable, and you have x2, the second variable, down to sk, which is the um its variable and the error term, of course. And so this is a broad, like an equation um, that represents like the multiple linear regression. And so let's take a look at an, ex an example, um, an example like to create a linear model to predict the price of an automobile. And um, typically what you would do is to like, get the data set and feed it into like a linear model in um, Python. You could, you could, you can actually compute this like mathematically, but this is where programming comes in. Like it makes it really easy. Um, there are a lot of Python packages that we can use of which we're going to be doing in our coding session to help us to compute the um, linear regression model that represents the relationship. Um, and so, but let's look at this example. These are the features of, we got a data set of the automobile. 
And you have the price of different automobile, the uh, symbol, and these are the different features in the data set. And these are the relationship between the features. So the, the, this is a correlation plot that gives you a relationship between the features to like understand how they are related. And the ones that are, you can see like there is a, there's a color map that helps you to understand um, if it's the, the correlation. The correlation ranges from minus one to plus one. Plus one being post strongly positively correlated and minus one, minus one being strongly negative correlated and zero being there's no correlation between the variables. And so based on the color mapping, you can judge uh, what variables are like closely related, correlated, like when we make correlated means that are closely related in terms of the relation between both variables. And so if you have, um, let's, let's, let's take an example. We have the um, price and um, so we're looking at the price and let's say symboling. And so symboling, it's, we can we use using this value or the sorry using this color we can judge that it's maybe somewhere around here I meaning it's around uh the value of uh minus 0 0.25 which implies that it is somewhat negatively correlated and so and it's poorly negatively correlated because it's closer to zero right and so however if you have a lighter let's look at the price and the horsepower right the host part it's somewhere with the, the color here yeah, mapping it's somewhere around here and so it's uh about 0 0.75 which is positively correlated and almost strongly positively correlated um there are other ways when we get to the coding session there are other ways we can make this map more like we can have the values represented but this is just to give us an example of how correlation plot really looks like. Um, and this is like a result from the linear regression, like different variables. Um, uh, one of the major things that we look out here, it's the R, what we call the R square, which is zero, um, the, it, it gives you the, it's called the coefficient of determination, um, which is used for, it gives you a measure of how closely the line that fits that those points represents the entire data set. What I mean by that is when we when we look at the regression line here, you have different points, right? You have different uh, points in the graph, and then you're trying to fit a line to that point, right? And so the the I wouldn't want to go deep into like mathematics, like trying to understand like breaking it down but essentially what happens is the error is being calculated and then there is um you're trying to like see the difference between how well this line fits the model and so the r square it's that metric that gives you an insight into how well the line fits the model in which case how well the line represents how well the model represents the entire data set and so if you have a value of R square closer to one, it means you have a good model. Uh, however, if it's very low, like close to zero, it's good. it means that your model is not really good. And so this is without diving so much into the mathematics, like this is um, an overview of the linear regression. This is an output of how Python, like a package in Python can give you the uh, OLS results the ordinary least square results. Specifically, this is the ordinary least square method. Um, so a couple of things we've been able to achieve, um, like establish, it's the supervised learning. On the, the machine learning, there is like a subset, of three types of machine learning. You have the supervised learning, the unsupervised learning, and the reinforcement learning. And on the unsupervised learning, we have two classes of problem um, unsupervised learning. Sorry, the, sorry, under the supervised learning, you have the regression and the classification. And we just did like showed an example of how the classic uh, regression works using the 
linear regression, particularly the multiple linear regression. And with that, I would want to, because the case study project that we are going to be working on, it's not, it's based on a self feed of machine learning. And so I also want to run, give a run through of how that works, like the physics, and so it can help us to, to um, maybe give us like some tools, like mathematical intuition, when we start writing the code or writing the programs. And, and so what's deep learning? So deep learning, it's a part, like a broader set of the family of machine learning methods also that is based on data representation as opposed to like the task specific algorithms. Um, what this means is rather than trying to be task specific in terms of supervised, unsupervised, like the way it is right off the bat for the different algorithms, um, deep learning uses different data representations, lens it, and then you can finally like make it a supervised learning, a partially supervised learning or unsupervised. And so it's a subset of machine learning. And you can see the diagram there that just summarizes this artificial intelligence, machine learning, and then deep learning. And so most of what you see in the on the large scale of things, especially in the everyday applications, especially in the last five years in and what we'll be calling artificial intelligence very smart, it's more or less deep learning. And deep learning is, deep learning is inspired by the structure of the human brain. Um, it uses a multi-layered structure of algorithms called neural networks. And so that will lead us into like, what, uh, when, when do you use deep learning or when can you use deep learning or why do we even need to use deep learning? And so, well, deep learning is suitable for a large amount of data and features. Features uh, when you have very large amounts of data, and you have so many features like high, high dimensional space. That is where you it's more efficient to use deep learning because uh, it leads to the last point. It's very it, it's can identify very complex patterns, and so there are certain limitations like the other algorithms will not be able to identify, but with deep learning, you'll be able to identify very complex patterns. And um, it can easily extract features from unstructured data. Now, um, if you look at the graphic I have on the right-hand side, you have like, like maybe an image. Um, so linear regression cannot, or logistic regression cannot, on its own, cannot, um, it can do like you can do classification with with um, logistic regression, but it's not going to be computationally um, wise to do that because you're going to be spending a lot of time processing the image. After which, you would have um, you would have to uh, ex which is which means extracting the features before classification. And the classification aspect is also going to take a lot of like computation, like using a lot of processing power to do that. And so it's computationally expensive to use, and it's not efficient to use some of these classical machine learning algorithms. And so well, that's one reason why for unstructured data, deep learning, it's able to do the feature extraction, like being able to extract the feature, features from unstructured data. When I mean unstructured data, I, I'm referring to pictures, images, I'm referring to text. There are deep learning algorithms that can extract these features and feed it into the classification algorithm for you to carry out for tax. And so when you have the inputs, say for example, the input image, you, 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 uh, with, with machine learning, you would have to extract the features and then carry out the classification for you to classify if it's a car or not a car. Um, however, with, with deep learning, you can just have to feed with the right deep learning um, architecture. You can um, 
feed the image to the architecture like the algorithm and it's able to extract the features as well as carry out the classification tasks. And it's able to predict if it's a car or not a car. And so deep learning is really powerful. That's why we can, we've been seeing a lot of advancement in image processing, facial recognition. Um, this is what powers it. And um, also in text processing, like um, in chatbots, um, what we call very conversational AI, which is more or less like understanding very uh, almost human level response from chatbots. Uh, it's because it's been able to process very large amount of data and is able to learn so much that it can almost respond as a human being. And that is almost not obtainable with the machine, classical machine learning algorithms, but it's, it's uh, obtainable with deep learning. And so that's why you have companies like Google, um, OpenAI, and uh, other big companies investing so much in deep learning, trying to create the public ad algorithms for chatbots or structured data generally. Cool. Now this said, I want us to build some mathematical intuition, just like we did for linear regression, like, and try to connect it and see if we can, um, that with that, we can be able to build some tools we would use to uh, walk through our case study project. Okay. So, um, okay. So, so let's talk about the fundamental, like, I know sometimes when we see these diagrams, it becomes really like, oh, what's this again? Like where I know that I don't, I want us to, want us to like, I, I really appreciate you stay with me. I'll try to explain them as little, like try to like relate them um, to make it really easy for us to digest. And so, this is like I, I I mentioned that the deep learning is inspired by the human brain, and so particularly the human brain is made up of several neurons, so many neurons like, and these neurons are connected to each other and they fire um, information across the different neurons, and so even though the deep learning neuro the deep learning neural network it's modeled after the human brain there's little differences but not so much but then the this is an example of like the human cell like the new the neuron in the brain and so you have like the dendrites which is the inputs right it takes the inputs more or less like information from another neuron and it takes it and it's, and it's assessed into the cell body there are a lot of like cell activities that takes place and then you have the axon, which sends the output to whichever um, functioning system that needs it, and so it sends it to the next neuron. And so, without going deep into like how we're not in the biology class, I would this is essentially how the neuron works of uh, the human in the human brain in the nervous system. And so. Trying to like take a knowledge, trying to take that knowledge, transfer that knowledge to uh, the deep learning neural network, just the neuron. This is like a representation of that neuron also. So you have the input, which is P, right? And this symbol here, the summation, it's like the cell body, right? And the neuron, the, which is the input and what we call the weights. Um, there is a transformation, like um, ma mathematical transformation that takes place. Like the, in this case, this is like an addition in this, exactly an addition in this place. And it produces a net output, which is transformed by function to give you an output. And so look, one thing I want us to understand is that this is not so much different symbolically from what we learned in linear regression. If you take a look at it, it almost models the same pattern. You have A equals F, W, P plus B, where 
In this case, the B is the intercept and W is your, um, it's the, the coefficient. YP is the impulse, which is like X, the, in, the independent variable. So it's so this is a very simple neuron, just like, but it models closely what we already know as a linear, uh, simple linear model, right? And so, but we can't really do so much. We'll still be limited if we stick to just this neuron. And so in order for us to be able to unleash the power of the planning, we'll try as much as possible to see how we can feed in more than one neuron and connect these neurons to make them interconnected. And so with multiple inputs, because right now we just have one input, right? With this, we can have multiple inputs. They like have so many multiple, you have multiple inputs and then you have the same neuron feeding in to the, uh, more like the cell body. And then you have like a net output and then you apply a function to give it an, an output. However, for us to have multiple inputs, we would have to like perform mathematical operations. Particularly, we have to perform uh, the WP in this case would be a mat matrix operation. Um, and this is a symbol that represents generally how, um, how like a condensed um, symbol that represents what we have on the left-hand side. And so, I know things are beginning to get a little bit like maybe uh, confusing, but I just want you to like understand the overview. You don't need to like understand the details, but if all you can get from this slide is this is like a linear regression, but then you have so many inputs. And in addition to that, so many inputs, you now have so many coefficients with the bias stem, which is like the intercept, that is fine. Right. And so this is this this the only thing it's I'm as much as possible, I'm trying to let us understand that the linear regression can also be in quotes, can also be represented in a neural form. And so that is the way it's being modeled. But then again, we can't make so much information, process so much thin, um, information with just one neuron, because our brain makes use of so many neurons. And so you have to make use of so many networks, so many networks, each network connected to each other. And this is what constitutes a neural network. And so what is the, what comes out of the outfit from the first layer of the network is fed to the second network, the second layer for it to be processed. And then it's, 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 um, it's also like an outfit to the third layer for it to be processed. And it becomes really like uh, a more or less you are able to break down the information to get more information, to learn more with more layers and with more neurons. And so that's the idea behind neural networks. You are able to learn so much, like um, you have to get these networks together to form a neural network. So with these, we can this is a condensed formula, like a condensed diagram that shows the same thing about like having several inputs, different layers of network, and you have like a neural network. So the neural network is the brainchild of deep learning. It's what the magic happens. Everything about deep learning you've been hearing about, it's all concentrated about. It's all modeled as the foundational um, unit of deep learning. It's neural network, right? And for the neural network, we have, so how do you train a neural network? What happens is this, you put in the input data and it calculates an output, right? And so when you put in, feed in the input data and it calculates an output and it gets an output, it's going to compare the output with the output labels. 
You remember this is a supervised, what we talked about supervised, you have the output labels and you already have like the output from your network. And so from there, we are going to calculate what we call an error. And then there's going to be some optimization. We really do not need to go into the details of that. And based on the optimization that happens, like the, the um, what we call back propagation happens, based on that error, it updates the weights. By weight, it means it's trying to correct the error that it made while it was computing the initial output. So what happens essentially is if I'm trying to predict if it's a boy or a girl, the first four pass will not give me an accurate prediction. And so when it gives me that, when it gives me a false prediction and the compute states the loss, it's able to like self-correct using the back propagation algorithm. And it's able to like correct the and, it be, and that is a process of the learn, of learning when we talk about deep learning because it's correcting itself. So you have to like put a foot, foot forward pass, a forward propagation, calculates the error, and then it back propagates. Essentially, that is how you train in neural network. So I know there's been a lot in the last couple of slides, but as this captures what a neural network is and how you can train a neural network. Putting the data into the neural network, you calculate the loss that you are used to compare with the output levels, and then you calculate a back propagation. You do a, a, um, a back propagation that updates the network and it learns. And after a while, depending on the set metric, um, like in our case in linear regression, we have the R square, but in this case, you can set a different metric depending on the problem, you are able to um, get is setting accuracy. And so when you hear of like, oh, we did train these models and it's got an accuracy of 90%, this is what happens. And based on the loss, the accuracy is now calculated. And so you kind of have an accuracy of maybe 90%, you could have an accuracy of 80% and you try to like understand if it makes sense. So having said that, I'm going to delve into the last part of the well, to this section before we, uh, like I said, to this session, we're not going to be doing um, coding. We're not going to be diving into coding, but we're just going to, I just wanted us to understand this because this is going to be crucial when we start coding. We we'll are applying all oh, the neural network, the feed forward, the loss, and the backward propagation. I'm going to be talking about the aspect, the last aspect that we need in order to work on our project, it's the convolutional neural network. Now the convolutional neural network, it's a special type of neural network that it's um, modeled after the visual cortex of the brain. That is the part that is responsible for us to like see. And so it's, it's called, it's a structure of neurons and connections that enable us to like see and label objects. And uh, when it computer sees a picture, this is what the computer sees. Uh, it's just a bunch of numbers, which is like different matrices. And so um, the neural network, it's the CNN, the convolution neural network con consists of the feature extraction part, which helps to extract those features from the images to make it like matrices. And then you have like the classification part which helps to classify if the image is correct or it's not correct. And so in our case study, we're going to be seeing, it's still almost, uh, what, what, training a neural network in CNN is still the same as what we had before. You would have like a fit forward pass, you calculate the error, you would optimize it, calculate like the loss, and then do it back propagation. I know it seems like it's a lot like complex, but I think we just get the flow that if you have the feed forward pass, calculate the error based on the uh, the the output labels, and then you can update to calculate the errors. And then uh, this is a visual presentation of um, what the CNN like. You have like an input, maybe a car, and after passing through the series of networks. It comes out here and compares 
with the output to see if it's correct. If it's not correct, it goes back to like update the weight. And so um, with this, we will be able to like get like an overview. We've been able to build some tools, understanding what the neuron is, what the neural network is, how to train a neural network, and how to convert extra features from that. And so the next um, section, we're going to be diving into the case study, which is a face max detector. Uh, we want to build a model to identify whether a face, a face image is wearing a face max, a max correctly.
talking about responsive AI, trying to understand how these neural networks work. And so to answer your question directly, yes, you can use it, but there's a caveat that it produces a result. So um, deep learning doesn't give you the uh, explanation in terms of like trying to get the inference as much as statistical or what I would call classical machine learning would give. But then you can also use it for predictive analysis. Yeah, I have a good article. I'll try to send it out to the group um, that some psychology colleagues um, or faculty wrote as a, in terms of how it opens up a whole new set of research questions in the social sciences um, that we haven't been able to answer in the past because of this area around prediction. And now that they're starting to use machine learning in their research, they're finding that there's a whole area of research that we've never looked at before because we didn't have these tools available to us, which is kind of a different way of thinking about it, of not using it to answer the same questions, but now we can ask different questions that we didn't have tools before. Uh, and if you get into the black box issues, I have a doctoral student who that's her research is going to be around that and she works on different tools for transparency within networks. Um, and she uses a variety of different tools that help tell you which factors are providing the highest loadings at different parts of your network and how those relationships are influencing your results. Yeah. Thank you so much. I would love to read that. Yeah, I'm looking for it. I have it unorganized in a set of files, unfortunately. Someday I'll clean up my box folder, I guess. Someone did ask, I said, are there any things mm -hmm. that you recommend for two weeks from now? Any things that you think people, videos they should watch, okay. things they should look at? Okay, so I think I, I don't have any curated now, but I think um, that's a great thing to do. Maybe I can curate maybe one or two videos and uh, I'll post it. I don't know if everyone in a Slack channel I can post it on the Slack channel. Uh, yeah, I think everyone it, is in Slack, but if not, they can drop me an email and okay. I can put them into Slack. That's yeah, probably I'm just a good way to some put it together. Time, yeah, I'm going to take some time to like create some videos that would really be helpful. Yeah. Yeah, there are some really good visual representations, especially like the convolutional neural networks, that once you see it animated, it makes a whole lot more sense than when it's two dimensional. Um, well, thank you. Okay, well, if there's no more questions, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording. Um, And we'll post the video to the website and announce um, so people who couldn't make it. And I know a couple had to leave early um, and take off. So it's a good pre setup, I think. I wish I had had it before the first time that I actually tried playing with machine learning in Python. <laughs> 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 Having the structure in your head helps. Thanks so much, everyone, especially you, S.A. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, S.A. Yes, thanks, S.A. And Ernest, um, as I mentioned earlier, John and I got a grant from a group called New America Foundation and the Board Foundation to actually have some funding available to pay for the time of students who are trying to further their coding skills to work with faculty who have projects for them to work on. Because uh, one of the things John and I both recognized is that students can only get so much out of their courses, but it's when they actually do projects where they have to pick up new skills and learn new techniques that their coding skills really advance. Uh, so later this semester, we've been working on getting it started. We'll send out, um, information and we'll have forms for faculty to apply to have students and an application for students to apply saying these are the skill areas I want to develop in 
and then that'd we'll be, try to match them. That'd be wonderful. Projects, I think, are the key to learning. In fact, uh, people at the uh, MIT Media Labs, uh, they sent them the three Ps of projects uh, that really make learning uh, uh, fun and productive. So I found that throughout my whole learning experience myself and teaching projects are really the key. Yeah, definitely. That's how I learned. I had things I wanted to do. And so the only way to do them was to learn some skills. Um, so it does help. And please spread the word with your colleagues. We've had pretty good attendance from the business school. We've been, um, but the more the merrier on our Friday meetups. Did you know Ed Cherian, by the way? Oh, yes, for many years. Yeah. Yeah, he was, when I came to GW in 2001, he kind of took me under his wing and he was a good friend and mentored me well in my career. I haven't heard from him in many years, but I wonder what he's doing now. Uh, I'm sure he's into mischief somewhere. He... Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, I have to run to another thing too, so. Thank you again, and just drop me a note essay when you have those materials, and I'll put them out. Okay, sure, I will. I will. Thank you so much. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you.